Greetings again today in the name of Jesus Christ, our wonderful Lord and Savior. Now it's good to see you here in the house of the Lord on this beautiful Lord's Day. You know, you'd almost have to be sick to miss out in church today. I would be providentially hindered. And we appreciate you that's uh, come to be with us today. We appreciate our visitors. See some of our visitors coming in from Tacoa. We're glad to have them visiting with us today. And we have visitors from different places. Just glad you're here. And we welcome every one of you. We want you to know that. And you that's listening out in the radio listening audience, we appreciate you tuning in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour that's coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church here in Athens, Georgia. Now, this is Preacher Edward speaking. We're hoping during the coming hour we can be a blessing to you. And I'm sure what Paul has lined up for us in the way of singing will be a blessing to our hearts. So we'll turn the service to him, but in the meantime, you call someone on the phone, you out in the radio listen audience. Tell them to tune in and get to Northside Baptist Church Hour. That way you'll be doing them a favor, be doing us a favor, and we appreciate it very much. Now if you have your Bible, turn to 1 Samuel chapter 6, would you please? A few Sundays ago, I spoke on the subject, Be Not Like a Mule. Today I'm going to speak on the subject, Two milk cows. Now that may sound kind of strange and yet it's biblical. And we'll find out when you get to 1 Samuel chapter 6. I'm now sending out a book that I'm sure that every Christian, every born again believer would be interested in if you're really concerned about spiritual truths and things in the Middle East. On Jerusalem, the city of peace and war. I have a few copies available if, if you're interested in them. If you write in and close a gift to be used to help pay for expense and radio time, we'll get the book in the mail to you. Just request it and say, Preach Edward, send me the book in our offering on Jerusalem, the city of peace and war. It's written by the late A.E. Logan, great Bible teacher. He's gone on to be with the Lord, but that's a wonderful book. He made a trip to the Holy Land. He knew much about of course, the history of Israel and things pertaining to Jerusalem. And he wrote that book. I'll tell you, it's, it's a book that can enlighten you in regard to Jerusalem and the Middle East. There's something about that name Jerusalem that's fascinating. You mention that name anywhere you go all over the world. And you'll see people kind of perk up and because it's a name that it sticks with you. It's a name that, of course, has been mentioned many times, and it's a city of God, a city God had built here upon the earth when back in the early days of his uh, movement of the Hebrews. Been many wars there, it's been torn down many times and rebuilt. Now turn, will you please, to 1 Samuel chapter 6. That's in the Old Testament, of course, and it's page 324. Now we find here that the ark of the Lord had been captured by the Philistines. And the Philistines were always enemies of Israel. And so they captured this ark. They kept it for seven months. And then uh, trouble began to happen to them during the seven month period. Uh, mice began to destroy their crops. And their god Dagon couldn't stand up right. And things just wouldn't go right for them. And they said, we've got to get rid of the ark of the Lord and send it back to Israel where it belongs. And here in chapter 6 of 1 Samuel, you have the story. And I won't read as many verses as I'd like today because of time. But you can reread these verses and read this chapter and it will be beneficial to you. Now in verse 1 of 1 Samuel 6, and the ark of the Lord was in the country of the Philistines seven months and the Philistines called for the priest and the diviners saying, What shall we do to the ark of the Lord? Tell us wherewith we shall send it to its place. And they said, If you send away the ark of the Lord of Israel, send it not empty, but in any wise return him a trespass offering, then ye shall be healed. And it shall be known to you why his hand is not removed from you. Then said they, What shall be the trespass offering which we shall return to him? They answered, Five golden emrods and five golden mice, according to the number of the lords of the Philistines, for one plague was on you all and on your lords. 
Wherefore ye shall make images of your emeralds and images of your mice that mar the land. And ye shall give glory unto the God of Israel. For adventure he will lighten his hand from off you and from off your gods and from off your land. Wherefore then do you harden your hearts as the Egyptians and Pharaoh hardened their hearts when he had wrought wonderfully among them? Did they not let the people go and they departed? And now therefore make a new card and make two milk kine, that is milk cows, on which there has come no yoke, and tie the kine to the cart, and bring their calves home from them. And take the ark of the Lord and lay it upon the cart, and put the jewels of gold, which you return him for a trespass offering, in a coffer by the side thereof, and send it away that it may go. And see if any goeth up by the way of his own coast to Beth Shemath. Then he hath done this great evil, but if not, then we shall know that it is not his hand that smote us. It was a chance that happened to us. And the men did so and took two milk cows and tied them to the cart and shut up their calves at home. And then the story goes on how these two milk kind, these two milk cows, began to lead the way from the land of the Philistines to carry the ark of God back to Israel where it belonged. Now you read much about animals in the Bible, about cows and mules and horses and dogs and whatnot. A lot of stories told about animals, no doubt about that. Many years ago, there's a person that lived in the city of New York that never seen a dairy, never seen, really seen a cow, a live cow, but they had been drinking milk all of their lives and they had received many milk cartons and bottles into their homes over the years. So one Sunday afternoon, they were taking a ride out of the city for the first time and going out in the country for many miles. And they came by a dairy. And there they saw a huge pile of milk bottles. And one of them became excited and said, Look, look, I wish you'd look. said, I believe yonder is a cow's nest. So they'd never seen a cow or dairy and they made sure they'd found a cow's nest out there in the country. All they knew, they'd been drinking the milk for a long time. Now today I want to mention many things about these two milk cows. Now of course they were obedient. They were used to carry the ark of God back to Israel. And the first thing I want to mention about them is the fact that they had forsaken all. They forsook all they had in order to carry this cart back with the ark on it. In verse 10, And the men did so and took two milk cows and tied them to the cart and set up their calves at home. Now they had to get this ark back to Israel in a very unique way. They couldn't carry it just in any manner. And this was the best method to do it, to get two milk cows that never had a yoke on them, never been hitched to a cart, and then hook up those milk cows to the cart and start on the way back to Israel with the ark on the cart. And that they did. But these two milk cows had two young calves. And they had to leave those and move forward for God. Now that's what they did. They had to leave their calves at home. They had to leave their barn, their stalls, where of course they dwell. They had to leave their pasture where they grazed. They had to leave the farmland on which they grew up and say goodbye to their calves and move on their way back toward Israel. And these two cows did that. The Bible says in Luke chapter 14 and verse 33, So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh all he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Now God says if we want to be good disciples, good followers, then we must be willing to forsake all that would hinder or tie us up with this world and follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we have a lot of people today that talk creamy, but they live blue John lives. Now you can talk creamy and live blue john and mount to nothing when you come to die. If you're going to talk creamy, live creamy. If you're going to live blue john, then of course don't expect anything when you come to the end of life's journey. And these old milk cows went on their way pulling the ark of God on that cart. Now I was born on a farm and you people know that. You in the radio listeners probably can detect that by uh, my uh, messages I bring 
I'm proud of the fact that I spent many years as a boy on a farm. I really am. And if you have never had to go out and milk cows early in the morning and late in the afternoon, barefooted boy, and go out and sit down and milk those cows, then you have missed something as a lad. Now, if you have never had a cow to smack you in the face with a tail with about six cuckabars in it, then you still miss something. If you've never sat down to milk a cow barefooted as a little boy and that cow raise up that right hind leg and sock it down on top of your feet, you've still missed something as a lad. Now those things I have experienced. As a little boy growing up, we had a cousin that lived in Atlanta. He was a city slicker. It's always amazing to us country boys as what he would do and how he would act when he would come to Atlanta to visit us during the summer. Sometimes he'd stay maybe several weeks out in the country. And one night he wanted to try milking a cow. Now can you vision that? He had never milked a cow, knew nothing about it. So he was given that privilege. But he did some things wrong. One thing he did wrong, he sat down on the wrong side of the cow. Now some of you people didn't know that. You just can't milk a cow on either side with your hands. You got to be on the right side to milk a cow. And he didn't know that. He got on the left side. And so he started trying to milk and did milk a little and the cow didn't like it. She kept looking back at him and giving her disapproval and finally she just smacked him one with a hind leg and whopped him one with the end of a tail and crammed a foot into the, what milk he had in the container. And he knew he was in trouble. He saw that uh, milk and all dirtied up by that cow's foot. And he, he was going to be wise and smart. He was going to straighten that out. So he goes around and opens the cow's mouth and go make the cow drink the milk. And when he was asked what he was doing, he said, I'm trying to run this milk back through this cow. It's all dirty and I want it clean and I think it should be clean. Now that, that city slicker knew nothing about a dairy, knew nothing about milking a cow or, or anything of that sort. Now we had cows as a boy, they wouldn't give anything, you had to take it. But we had some you could take two or three gallons a day from, some you could take a quarter or half a gallon and those things I experienced as a young boy growing up, and I appreciate it, meant a lot to this country preacher. And so I learned a little something about milk cows. And then as I read this story here, it became more fascinating. As I thought about those days when I helped my dad on the little dairy there, we milked the cows. We had to do it by hand in those days. They have the automatic milkers today, which is different for these dairies, but back then, we children had to do the job, and we learned to milk with both hands. Had a lot of people that only milk with one, but we didn't waste any time. We learned to milk with both hands, put the bucket between our knees and go to town. And so we learned those things. But we find that these cows here had to be say called the head. Number two, they were placed on these cows, the ark. Now this ark was something very holy. It's symbolic of power. It was symbolic of the presence of God. And of course, the Bible says in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Now, God wants us to have power. I know we're living today a firecracker life in an atomic age, and that's not pleasing to God. God wants us to have power of His Spirit upon us as Christians. Now, this ark is symbolic of that. In Acts chapter 5 and verse 32, and we are His witnesses of these things, and so it's also the Holy Ghost whom God has given to them that obey Him. So in order to be controlled by the Spirit of God, that's what it means to be filled with the Spirit. It means to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. There must be a complete surrender unreservedly to God and let God have your life and let God speak through you and use you. We find that God said in Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 3 in comparison to His people Israel, he said, The ox knoweth his honor, and his ass the master's crib. But Israel does not know, my people do not consider. Now God said, That ox, that cow, knows exactly where to come and get his food. And in due time, whenever it's time to be fed, they come and they get their food. But he said, My people, Israel, they don't consider that. They don't realize that all blessings come from me and I provide for them. They don't take that in consideration. And you'd be surprised today at the people that are likewise. They eat their food. They drink good water. They wear decent clothes. They live in fine homes. They drive good automobiles. They have spending money. 
But not one time do they ever look to God in appreciation for what they have. God's been good to us. And so God said, my people are worse off than cattle in that respect when they don't do that. A calf, a cow knows where its food comes from. Then we come to thought number three, and that is these two old milk cows pulling this cart walked a straight way. Now when they were hooked to the cart, they didn't weave in and out, and they went straight down the road. They went straight toward Israel. They had a job to do and they were carrying the ark of God back to Israel. And these cows went straight. Nobody led them. The people that went along were behind them. And these cows were left on their own. And they left their calves back home lowing and crying for their mother. But they went right on down that road. Nobody guiding them but God himself. And they went straight to the place well, they would have carried that ark. They walked on a straight way, and that's what God wants us to do. The Bible says in verse 12, And the cows took the straight way to the way of Bethshemeth and went along the highway. So these cows knew where to go. God Almighty put that instinct in these cows to go to the right place and head out in the right direction and not weave around, and, but go straight forward carrying that ark. And that's exactly what God wants us to do. To walk the straight and narrow way. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, Enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many of thee which go in thereat, because straight is the gate and narrow is the way, which leadeth unto life, and few be that find it. So God wants us to walk the straight and narrow way and not try to straddle the fence and try to go both ways. Some people like the man out in Texas that jumped on his horse and rode off in every direction. Now we can't do that. We have a straight, narrow way to go and God wants us to walk the straight path. Remind the old man and woman, their cow got out and they searched and searched in vain for the cow and couldn't find her. And, and they became uh, irritated about it. And the old man, he was real irritable. He said, ah, we got to find that cow. He said to his wife, he said, that cow has to be somewhere in the neighborhood and and I want us to go down here to this creek. And he said, I want you to go down on one side of the creek. And I'll go down on the other side of the creek. So that devilish cow might be on both sides of this creek. So we have a lot of church members like that today. They want to be on both sides of the creek at all times. But you can't do that. You've got to be on one side or the other. You can't say good God on Sunday and good devil on Monday and expect God's blessings. You must be on the straight and narrow path on the right side of the creek. If you're going to get the job done for God. And so these are two cows went forward going down the straight and narrow road leading straight to their destination. Then we come to thought number four. And that is they voiced out as they journeyed. Look at verse 12. And the kind took the straight way the way of Bethshemeth and went along the highway lowing as they went. Now these cows, when they left their calves and left their home, left their stall, headed straight toward Israel, they went along the straight highway and they didn't go along in silence. The Bible said they lowered as they went. Have you ever heard of cow lower? Well, every one of you have heard of cow lower, I'm sure. And they went along lowering, you know. They went down the road and if anybody in the field heard the noise, they knew there's a couple of cows coming down the road. They were lowing. They were making noise. They were letting people know that they were traveling down the straight road. And that's exactly what God wants us to do. We have too many silent church members that never witness for God, never speak up for the Lord, never say anything for God on the job or in the community. Come to church on Sunday and when you go home you forget about it and never mention God, never witness during the week. That's not pleasing to the Lord. Amen. God wants us to be witnesses seven days a week. And these cows lowered as they went. The Bible says in verse 12, they did so. And in Isaiah chapter 62 and verse 6, the Bible said, Ye that make mission of the Lord, keep not silent. If you know God, if you are saved, don't go around with a shut mouth. Talk about the Lord. Witness for God. Give out some tracts. Invite people to your church. Be doing something for God. Do something for God every day. 
witness for the Lord. They went down that road lowing and they wouldn't shut up. And God's people should not shut up either. You should keep on keeping on down the highway for God, making a noise as you go. A noise is unto God. The Bible says in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8 that we are witnesses. You shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the uttermost part of the earth. God wants us to be witnesses. Man one time went to, I was working in a plant and, and uh, he got saved. He went to a place where that, uh, there's a meeting going on and he was gloriously saved. And he knew when he got back to the plant where he worked, if he told the people about it, they'd ridicule him. They'd make all kind of fun of him. And so he came back to the place where he worked. In about a couple of weeks, he went back to the meeting. Someone asked him, said, well, how'd you come out on your job? He said, did fine. Said they haven't found it out yet. And so that's the way it is. A lot of church members, uh, they don't even know you're saved. They don't even know you're saved, let alone... Uh, would they accept a witness from you because they don't even know you're saved? Everybody you work with in your community ought to know that you're saved. Let them know you're saved. Tell them you're saved. And then talk about it. God expects you to do so. And the Bible says we're to be witnesses for the Lord. Number five, these old milk cows continued on to the end. Now we have church members today that They'll run well for a while and then they stop and backslide on God and many of them has never been saved. And there's some few that's been saved that backslide on God. But God wants his people to continue on right on to the end of life's journey. Amen. The Bible says in verse 12, they turned not to the right hand or to the left. They kept straight down the road, kept their eyes in the direction where they were headed and they would not turn to the left nor right and would not stop. They just kept on going. We're to run our race with our eyes on the goal, the Bible tells us. In Galatians chapter 6 and verse 9, let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season you shall reap if you faint not. There'll be times when you become weary, you become discouraged, you want to give up, but God said don't do it. He said, you'll reap if you faint not. Right at the very time, whenever you're just about ready to reap, then you faint. And you're most certainly not going to reap if you faint. God says, faint not. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 58, to be always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. He said, be always abounding, not just on Sunday, but every day, seven days a week, be abounding in the work of the Lord. You ought to do that. That's what's going to count when you come to die. When you come to the end of life's journey, God's not going to say to you, how much real estate did you have? How big was your bank account? How about your stocks and bonds? How many friends did you have? Uh, what were you thought about in your community? Uh, were you very popular? How about the polit political field you were in? God's not going to ask those questions. The only thing that's going to really count when you come to die is what you've done for God. Now you let that sink in. You may do a lot of things for other people, make a good name, but the only thing that's going to really count is what you've done for God. Move right along, ask God for His will, and God will show you His will for your life day after day. If you want to know the will of God for your life, you can know it. Kind of like the man that saved up enough money and he's going to buy him a milk cow. And he started down the road with his money in his pocket, and he met the preacher, and the preacher said, where are you going, neighbor? He said, well, I got money here, and a friend down the way has a milk cow, and we've come to an agreement, and I'm going to buy his cow. We've come to the price, and I have the money, and he has a good cow, and I'm going down and buy my friend's cow. The old preacher said, well, you ought to say the Lord willing you're going down and buy that cow. He said, the Lord willing to nothing. He said, I know what I'm going to do. He said, I got the money. The man's agreed to let me have the cow. I'm on my way now. I'm going to get that cow. The preacher said, sir, I still say you ought to say the Lord willing. You're going down and buy that cow. He said, Lord willing to nothing. He said, I know what I'm going to do. He said, all right. The man went on down the road, and before he got to the house where the man owned the cow, there was a robber. Hid in the bushes. He saw the man coming. He jumped out and jumped on him and beat him up and took his money away from him. Every penny he had tore his clothes and then took off. 
They asked him to poor man, no money, clothes tore, all beat up. He said, well, there's no point in going on down after the cow. I got no money. I'll just go back home. And on the way back, he came by the old preacher again. And the preacher said to him, said, well, neighbor, how'd you come out about the cow? He said, well, I, I, I didn't. He told the man, the preacher, what had happened and so forth. The preacher said, well, where are you going now? He said, I'm going home, the Lord willing. <laughs> so we ought to say, the Lord willing, we're going to do thus and thus. The Bible tells us do that in the book of James. Don't brag about what you're going to do tomorrow. In the book of James, he said, well, to say, the Lord willing, we'll do thus and thus Amen. on tomorrow. So they continued on to the end. And then number six, at the end of their journey, they brought great joy. These two old milk cows brought great joy. People shouted the victory. Now just think about two old milk cows bringing great joy to God's people. The Bible says in verse 13, And they of Bethlehem were reaping their wheat harvest in the valley. And they lifted up their eyes and saw the ark and rejoiced to see it. While they saw these two milk cows lowing coming down the road and, and they saw that the ark was on that cart and they had a shouting time. They said, praise God, the ark of God is coming back home. Praise the Lord, the presence of God is coming back to us. And they started shouting and praising the Lord and these old milk cows started lowing a little louder and a little louder, no doubt. And they were having a jubilee. Because these two old milk cows did what God told them to do. And if God's people be as obedient as these milk cows were, we'd get something done for God. In Psalms 126, in the first three verses, the Bible said, When the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, we were like them that dreamed. That was our mouth filled with laughter, our tongue was singing. Then said they, they among them, they among them, among the heathen, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us whereof we are glad. Now we have a lot to thank God for and a lot to be proud of and a lot to shout over. Amen? Amen. And we ought to do it. God's been so good to us. We're sitting here in America, born in this country, the greatest nation in the world, the richest nation in the world to its size. And God's been good to us and all over the world as people in starvation and People in prison, people deprived of a chance to go to church. We have a lot to be thankful for. We want to praise God for it. God's been good to us. Then number seven. These old milk cows, they became an offering of sacrifice at the end of the road. I want you to look at verse 14. And the cart came in the field of Joshua and Bethlehem and stood there where was a great storm. And they cleaved the wood of the cart and offered the kind of burnt offering unto the Lord. Now here after these cows had left their calves, come down the road lowing, as obedient as they could be, coming straight to their destination, bringing great joy to the people. When they got there, they became a sacrifice. These people slew these cows as an offering, as a sacrifice took these carts and took the cart and tore it up and put the wood on the altar. And these cows became a great sacrifice at the end of last year. They gave their all, they gave their lives. Now, beloved, when we come to the end of the journey, we ought to be able to bow at his feet and say, he did it all. The Lord did it all. Are we willing to do something for him? Keep in mind these two cows and what they did and how obedient they were. And even when they came to the end of journey, the journey of life for them, they were killed as a sacrifice. This should be the picture of every child of God as we sojourn. Many years ago out in the state of Texas, and this is a true story, there was a man, his wife, and little boy and girl involved in an automobile accident. Little girl was hurt severely, and they took her to the hospital, and they uh, was going to give her blood, and they detected she had a very rare type blood indeed. And they searched all over the hospital and found no blood to match hers. She would eventually die if they didn't get some blood. 
And so they called different hospitals and still could find no blood. And they searched and searched over the nation and could not find her type blood. It's a very rare type. They said, well, it's just a matter of hours and she'll be gone if we can't find some blood to match hers. And they checked her mother and dad's blood and it didn't work. And then they decided they'd check her little brother. And they checked the little brother's blood and lo and behold, it was exactly the same type. And they said, of course, if he'll give his blood, now we can save her life. And so they called a little fellow to the side. He know what it's all about. And they asked him this question. They said, son, would you be willing to give your blood that your little sister might live? He said, yes, sir, if you'll let me go and tell mom and daddy goodbye and talk to them first. I'll be glad to. Now, that was a little fellow that thought that he was going to have to die to save his sister. He didn't know they were just going to take part of his blood and he would still live. He, he thought he was going to die and he wanted to talk with mom and daddy first and tell them goodbye, but he was willing to die that he might save his little sister's life. Now Jesus, when he died on the cross, he shed God's blood and shed that blood that we might be saved and eternally saved forever. How we ought to love him and appreciate him as we sojourn through life. Thank you kindly you listen well today. Everybody stand to your feet. Our Father, as we come to the close of this service, we thank you, dear God, for these two old milk cows that set a good example in the Word of God that your children should do likewise in what they did, be willing to sacrifice. Dear God, we pray today you use this message and speak to every heart and Speak to those in the radio listed audience and may your name be honored this day. And thank you for this privilege in Christ's lovely and matchless name. Amen. Now listen to me. In just a moment, Debbie is going to play a couple of stands and some invitation number. If you're in this building unsaved and you want to be saved, come down here. Let me help you to God. If you're backslidden on the Lord and you want to come back to God, come down here. Let me help you back to God. If you're here and you're looking for our church home and you believe in what we're doing here and willing to stand by this church and support this work here with your presence and so forth, then you want this to be your church home, come down and present yourself. We'll be glad to take that in consideration. And if God is speaking to you to come in any manner whatsoever, I want you to come while she plays. I may not have mentioned your need. If God is speaking, you want to come, but you come at this time. How about it? the message God laid on my heart now it's up to you the responsibility rests on your shoulder now I've given you what thus saith the Lord God while we wait 